Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Purple Daily, presented by Surly Brewing Company. Well, I think it's more important that you're, you just want to work with great great coaches, You know, whether it's a head coach, quarterback coach, assistant quarterback coach, quality control. You just want to be around great football minds. And, and I've always been fortunate in my 10 years in the league, I've been around some really great football minds. And, and I think our current staff is a continuation of that for me. And I, I do think I continue to be fortunate to have um, great coaches around me and around our team to help us. There he is. There he is, Mr. Game Winning Drive. Uh, and if those coaches that have come in here are as good as everyone hopes and as Cousins says, then they should be able to squeeze a little extra juice out of some of the players who haven't performed well, which is the theme of today's episode of Purple Daily, potential breakout candidates for the Minnesota Vikings in 2022. Presented by our friends at Surly Brewing Company. More on the draft party later in the show. And TCL, one of the world's best-selling consumer electronics brands. They have a new lineup of award-winning TVs delivering the most entertainment with stunning resolution, all at an affordable cost. Enjoy more of the things you love with TCL. We reject 500 football on this show. We just want the Vikings to win a damn Super Bowl before we die. Mackie, Judd, our executive producer, Declan Goff. And uh, you can't win a Super Bowl unless you... Get some players that are you know, youngish or on rookie contracts stepping up and providing more value. So let's go around the room here and let's talk about breakout candidates in mm. 2022. Mm. And I think we can just keep this sort of loosely defined. If there's a if there's a, a player that hasn't seen the field much, obviously that player would qualify. If there's veteran players that haven't reached their pinnacle, they might qualify. But let's just leave this as kind of a blank canvas and we'll start with Judd. Who is the number one player on your list to break out? So the top player on my my list to break out might not break out with a full-time role, but I really, I believe this going into 2021 and now with offensive guru Kevin O'Connell in charge, I believe this to be more true than ever. That opportunity will knock at the door of 2021 fourth-round pick Kane Wangwu. Mm -hmm. Did you guys know? So... This kid had two um, kickoff returns for touchdowns, which, by the way, unheard of now. Unheard of. But this extremely talented, very quick young man in 11 games last year had 13 rushing attempts for 61 yards. Okay, that's not much to start with. But perhaps even more surprising, he had four receptions on five targets for nine yards. Now, when I look at this kid, and I've said this since he was drafted, and I, I watch film of him with the Iowa State Cyclones, I look at this kid, and I see a Kansas City Chief. I see a guy who might not be a certainly an every-down player, but I see a breakout athletic talent, opportunity knocking at the door. If the coaching staff comes up with creative ways to use him, Right. This kid, to me, strikes me, if he can catch the ball at all, as a guy who I want to get his his hands on the ball in space. Hands on the ball in space. Got to love playing in space. Sorry. Right. Foot. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And when I do that, let the chips fall where they may, because there's going to be open field. So, I will say it for the second consecutive year, this time with an offensive coach at the helm. Kane Wong, to me, has the... And he showed this on the kickoff returns, the athletic ability and the speed to be a difference maker, change up factor, who was a very difficult matchup for defenses if he is used correctly. And I think KOC will do that. I think the biggest question, because I pulled up his official NFL.com pre draft scouting report from a year ago or whatever. And and the speed is there. I mean, this dude ran one of the fastest 40 times we saw his straight line speed as a kick returner. Like we see out in the open field kickoffs, we see what he can do. I don't think we saw enough of what he also may be possible offensively because they didn't, you know, they just, even when they gave him the ball in the run game, it was like, ah, uh, just run between the tackles. Like, I don't know if that's yes. the best way to use him. Yes. But some of the negatives on him and the reasons why he, you know, may have fallen in the draft or actually, I mean, what round did he go in? Wasn't he like a fourth round pick? He was, yes. he actually went higher than. The Vikings snagged him higher than his grade was because, quote, 
There just isn't much about his running style that feels natural. Wang Wu has open field speed to hit crease and go, but he's often indecisive with the ball in his hands, and he lacks a runner's instincts and fails to anticipate run lane development. Yeah, that's right. Football. Right. That's all correct. So, and that's also part of the reason why he didn't put up bonkers numbers at Iowa State. Like, you're wondering, how does a guy this fast not put up ridiculous numbers in college? And so the question is going to be, I don't think he's a full time. Like I don't think he's ever going to be a you know a nope. 150 200 touches guy. But knowing his limitations, but knowing his strengths, is there something you can do with him three or four times a game that makes sense? Right? Like that's that seems to be the the untapped potential of Wang Wu. Mm-hmm. It seems like they've lacked this kind of guy since Jarek McKinnon. Like, can he be Jarek McKinnon? when Jarek McKinnon was playing for the Vikings in that scat back that can catch some passes out of the backfield and have a little bit of explosiveness. Like, they they have lacked that. Like, Madison's a fine running back, and you can find Alexander Madison's in any draft. But they've also lacked this little type of scat back that, that they haven't had since Jarek McKinnon left. And can Kanae Wangu at least, I think, be that kind of player? Yeah, how about, like, a screen pass once in a while? That's the thing, right, yeah. We're, we're going to get some road graders out front, and you're going to have some space to work with. You know? The running lanes uh, problems are based on this. If you give him the ball and tell him to follow his blocks, he's not going to be great. But if you get him in space, if you establish that and get him in space and allow him the freedom to to not have to basically see what's what's developing because the play already has developed, guess what you got? An athlete. I'm just I'm so tired in this sport too of teams are like, well, he doesn't do this right, so we really can't play him. You yeah, know what does what does he do right? Yeah, right. You, and can you get an edge? And you're somewhere? the damn co- and you're the damn coaches. Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. All right, Declan. Who's breaking out? I'm gonna go a little off the cusp here and say it's a veteran player who you might not say is a breakout guy, but I think there is a next layer to his game in his second wind of his career. Essentially, I'm actually gonna go with Harrison Smith. And hear me out a little bit here. Okay. So he's a veteran guy, right? He's he's 32 years old, 33 years old. Last year, I think, finally dipped down a little bit, right? Like age tired to catch up to him a little bit. And the defensive backs in general with Minnesota weren't great. But the way he plays the game and the way that Ed Donatel, I think, is going to run this new system and how Kevin O'Connell kind of loves the illusion of complexity, all of those things fit Harrison Smith's game. And I think safety is also a position where he might have dipped off a little bit last year. But I don't think he's going to hit an absolute wall and fall off the cliff. In fact, I think he can have a second resurrection here in this new 4-3 defense where he can potentially be a really, really good player. And the player that we saw when he was a first-team All-Pro uh, earlier in his career. So it, it's a little off the cusp in terms of that he's a veteran guy. And it's, yeah, he's been around the block for almost 9, 10 seasons now. But in this new system, can he now unlock the, the player that he was before and take his game to the next level? So I'm actually I'm gonna go with Harrison Smith and shout out to uh, I believe it was my guy Okuni who asked this who said this on Vikings event line too which you can find on this channel that Harrison Smith has breakout potential too. So there might be you're saying that there might be a rejuvenation here of sorts yeah. in a in a, yeah. a late career act. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past one of the greatest safeties in Vikings history for sure. Um, I mean I think whether he breaks out or not he's definitely going to be in the Vikings Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. He might be a Pro Football Hall. I feel I feel like he needs like. A deep postseason run, like if he won a Super Bowl, I think people would say, "Oh, yeah," because didn't like Ed Reed got his Super Bowl, didn't he? In like 2012, yeah. like yeah, go get that Super Bowl, and and maybe he can be a Pro Football Hall of Famer. All right, the number one guy, and I I actually have a list of eight. Wangwu was one <laughs> of them. We can go through all these guys before the show's over, and we'll get to uh, a mock a day too. But the number one guy on my list played well for the most part last season, but I think could take a huge leap forward in his second season, Christian Derrissaw. If you look at the last six games of the year for Christian Derrissaw, he was actually one of the more highly graded offensive tackles in the NFL, according to Pro Football Focus. He had a three-game stretch where the season was very much on the line against San Francisco, the Rams, and the Bears. The Bears were sandwiched between the 49ers and Rams games. He allowed four total pressures across those three key games at left tackle. In this offseason, he doesn't deal with a hernia and all the other. Like, he was was banged up coming in, and then he had the hernia surgery, right? Like, he's going to be healthier. No Mike Zimmer doghouse BS. And he'll be much more comfortable entering the offseason program just 
having a year of NFL experience under his belt. So mm-hmm. I think Derrissaw goes from like, oh, is what's he going to be? Is he going to be a bust? Is he going to be healthy? It's like, okay, he played pretty well, held his own in year one. And mm-hmm. now stars are aligning for him to carry the momentum of the, uh, momentum of the last six games into 2022. And it's been a while since we've felt great about the Vikings left tackle situation. So <laughs> yeah. Riley Reeve had us feeling stable, but in terms of like, okay, who's going to be the, the eight-year guy at left Hello, tackle? First year. It feels like it's headed that way. Yeah. That was Hello. what, 2000? First year was great. 12. Yeah. 12. And, and he was fantastic. And then it was like, bang. Uh, yeah. I, I actually think that this is as good as I have felt about the Vikings' two offensive tackles in a long time. Yeah. Like, it's been a while since I felt like, I'm, I mean, the line is now, there are certain pieces interior wise that I don't love. But I mean, overall, this is as good as I felt about the line in ages. How many teams Tackles in the NFL, good. I'm putting you guys on the good. spot because it's hard with offensive line, but like, I'll bet you at least a third or maybe half the league would trade tackle situations with the Vikings right now. So you're telling me I get I get two dudes under the age of 26, right? Mm-hmm. Brian O'Neill. Mm-hmm. I bet you're right. One of the top five or six right tackles in the NFL. Yeah. And then Christian Derrissaw, wildly talented, improving throughout his rookie season, like, you know, it's not the best situation in the NFL, but it's there's still upside there, and these guys are young, and and hopefully you're going to have them both for five plus years. I bet you're right, because you've now got two pillars, and a lot of teams don't. Like that's tough. That's really tough. And and I actually don't mind uh, Cleveland at left guard too. Like right guard, I have no idea. Center, I don't like the player, but. Left tackle, left guard, right tackle, I think are pretty damn good. And it's been a it has been a while since I've I felt the three fifths of that line actually had this sort of stability. And it feels like there's enough options at right guard now. Like you've got you brought yeah, two veterans I, in. I agree. You, you know, Chris Reed. I feel like Chris Reed coming over from the Colts, right? Like yes. that's sort of the bar. Okay, if, if Chris Reed is your right guard, he's at least average. But if somebody you know, I'll throw Wyatt Davis out here too. Like, at, he's on my list of eight. You know, I, he's a little bit further down because what does it say about the Vikings' current brass's evaluation of Wyatt Davis that they felt the need to bring two veterans in to compete at right guard? You That's know? a weird one. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, I, he's not being given anything. He's going to have to earn. If he becomes the starter, he'll have to beat out like veteran players that have started whatever, you know, 40 games in the NFL. Yep. But um, but why, you got to put Wyatt Davis on this list of breakout candidates too. It's just I don't know how many <laughs> we haven't seen him. He's been in witness protection, and now the and now the new staff just brought in veterans for him to have to climb over to. I get a feeling that when training camp begins, that D- Davis is going to be somewhere approximately fourth on the depth chart. Like I think Reed's one. I think another one of the new new guys is probably two. So like it's it's weird. Like I don't know. If Davis did something internally that got him sort of shunned or what, but it does seem weird that it feels it feels like there's still a lack of trust among the the new guard with him, and so I don't think he's going to be just a total guess here anywhere near the close uh, uh, close to the top of that depth chart when training camp starts. Yeah, it just feels like that. What about I'm going to rapid fire some names at you guys here on the breakout list. Irv Smith Jr. we talk about every year, but he's yeah. got to be on this list again, right? Has to stay healthy. Absolutely. I think the the optimism is, is a little bit more tempered this time around, but like Tyler Conklin's gone, so he's he's the guy if he's if he's healthy. So it's tempered from from an Irv end of can, can he stay on the field? Here's where I am excited though, if he can. He is never going to be in a better system than he will now because I think he turns into a pseudo third receiver because the O'Connell offense does not really use a tight end as a traditional like Tyler Conklin go go yeah. slam into some some guys and make some noise and get five yards <laughs> and be tough. So I think Irv Smith has the abilities and intangibles to basically be a, a pseudo receiver. So if he can stay out there, like I think he will be used in packages with Jefferson and Thielen 
in which he'll take that step towards being described as a tight end, but actually playing a role that the best um, tight end receivers do. Yeah, That's I just need guess. I need Irv Smith in space, man. Think about all of these Vikings players if you get them in space. Justin Jefferson in space. K.J. Osborne in space. Smith Marset in space. They have Wang Wu. Irv Smith, like... There are some dudes. I mean, Dalvin Cook in space. There's just they have they have some great athletes at these positions. Cam Bynum as a breakout candidate. Now he played only about 200 snaps. Started like three games last year, but he was the Vikings' third best graded defensive player across all positions, according to Pro Football Focus last year, behind only Daniil Hunter and Michael Pierce. I kind of like him starting opposite Harrison Smith to start the season. That Baltimore game where where Smith um, was on the COVID list, I thought Bynum was fantastic. Absolutely great. And yes, this is one that I believe if you are going to tap into Smith, who is savvy, veteran, still productive player, this is perfect, right? Because he can help Cam out. I think that th- that this potential um, um, duo is fantastic. Because like... Harrison Smith is going to see things and be, be able to help Cam Bynum make adjustments immediately. So I actually think that this is an ideal mm-hmm. start the kid. Start the kid and and have faith that Harrison Smith is going to play a major role in his development to the point where, right. where this guy can become more than a productive player, but potentially a damn good player. Give him a chance. And I think it complements Smith's game. Like, like Smith is always, he hasn't had slappies next to him, but he's been such a good player uh, at, at his own position that he can make other players look really, really good too, right? Like he hasn't needed necessarily the help. Well, what if Cam Bynum steps in and is as good of a player as Harrison Smith and it makes Smith's game take up to the next level too? So I, I think there's like some yin and yang here that it really benefits both players. I'm curious how it plays out. What about Garrett Bradbury on the breakout list? I know he's not like an inexperienced rookie. He's got three years under his belt. The comp here would be Rams starting center Brian Allen, who really wasn't that great. He was a fourth-round pick. He was two years of sort of mediocre as Judd slinks off the screen. (laughs) But the Rams' offensive system made him uh, a really, really good player last year, and he signed a new contract going into the prime of his career. So you know, Garrett Bradbury was a former first-round pick, maybe hasn't had. I mean, look at the Vikings' recent track record of developing offensive linemen. It's Brian O'Neill is like the only one that's come out of this hodgepodge of draft picks and players Cleveland the last six bit. or seven years. Yeah, but Cleveland is like Cleveland's is an average left guard. Like if he's the second best success story, you no. Know. Yeah. How how about this? I think if Garrett Bradbury can get on the functional list, that's a win. Like I, I don't see a breakout. I don't think he's going to become good, but can he be functional? Okay. And and by that, I mean can he not be lifted off the line of scrimmage and thrown into the third row of the stands? I think if you can get him to a point of being functional and and being an asset to Kirk, which I don't think he has been, I'll probably take that. So forget uh, breakout. Too. I'm talking functional. Well, breakout doesn't have to mean Pro Bowl. Breakout can just mean, hey, you're a pretty good player now. You know, yeah, like you're, I'm you're, probably you're, you're still looking to replace him. I'm probably still going to be, but if he can just hold up and not get trucked, I'll probably be happy. <laughs> well, how not... interesting are the next few weeks going to be? Because they have to make a decision within like three weeks on his fifth year option. He's going into They're year four. They're not going to pick it up. They, they ain't right. They're, they ain't going to pick that up. But if they don't pick it up, doesn't that done. one way or the other signal the end of him? So if they don't pick yeah. it up and he has a bad year, at least he's just gone. But yep. If they don't pick it up and he has a good year, and now he hits the market. Isn't he more likely to go sign somewhere else for big money yep. and say screw you yep. guys? So like, Bye. It's probably the last year of Garrett Bradbury. Either way, functional. That's why I'm looking for functional. <laughs> uh, a few other players to throw out here. So Patrick Jones, the second, third round pick last year, team captain at Pitt. He had 18 sacks over the last two seasons in the ACC. You know, didn't really see much of him. And then uh, is it pronounced Chad Surratt or Chaz Surratt? I think it's the latter. I think it's Surratt. Yeah, I think it's the third round pick, linebacker. Uh, he ran a four five eight forty in the pre draft. I don't know if it was the combine or a pro day that he ran the four five eight before last year's draft, but 
that's a big part of the reason why Rick Spielman loved him, right? Just very toolsy and yeah. tested and well. And Zimmer had no time for him. Well, he played 98 special team snaps last year. Is there a role somewhere in the 3-4 for an athletic third-round pick linebacker? I would think so. Well, they Wouldn't need, you? They need some depth. They're going to need, at some point, probably someone to step in for injury purposes. Like, can this dude get a couple hundred snaps on actual defense, not special teams, in 2022? Can you develop players? Can you develop players? It felt like Mike did. It felt like there, there was definitely a period where Mike did exactly that, and then it was like, now I got my guys. It's like, but dude, your guys get old. So, yes. Can you develop? Do you have the want to to develop players? And, by the way, get out of them what they can give you, too. That's the thing, right? You, It can't be, well, he's not, he's not functioning like we want exactly, so screw him. Can you get, can you milk these players and find out what they're good at and get that? That's all I want. And then I'll throw one more name at you guys. Mm -hmm. This guy actually played way more than people probably remember last year because of injuries to like Michael Pierce, et cetera. But this man was third on the team in pressures last year. He had 33 pressures in part-time duty. Former six-round pick heading into year four, Armand Watts. I could yep. see Armand Watts again. I don't know if he, if he gets more than the 600 snaps he played last year, but like he had a good season. He's a good pass rushing interior defensive lineman. Absolutely, and Worked I hard. could I could see him either as a depth guy or maybe I mean who knows maybe he gets some run, some actual starting run at some point. But that's a guy that was kind of ah, he's a six round pick from a few years ago, whatever. <laughs> but like he has done some damage the last couple of years. So. Rotation, maybe, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rotational guy too, for sure. Uh, the guy that I, the guy that I think is maybe on course for a seismic shift in year three, Cam Dantzler. So the more I think about this, one, it was quite clear that Zim soured on 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 him. I don't know why exactly, but it was, and look, he didn't have a he didn't have a terrible year. He didn't have a good year. He sort of just had a middling. Second year on, by the way, week week one, he was not active. So, like, that sort of tells you how far the quick fall was. But here's the thing that intrigues me, again, is this. The cornerbacks in this defensive scheme are going to be asked to do different things and not as much. And so it's going to allow them potentially to probably uh, look more competent than they did in 2021. I think Camp Dantzler could... Now, probably with a uh, fresh start, he could have a very good chance at having a nice year, a really nice year, because of the difference in what what he's asked to do. And plus, from day one of training camp, it appears that his head coach won't be pissed at him. Yeah, he, and he's he's already. It's funny. I think he's gotten slapped with some narrative here, like you know him butchering the end of the the loss to the Lions. You know, yep. he was like the glaring obvious guy in the wrong spot and then him in the doghouse deactivated for week one like I think there's these there's a couple negative things here that people just hang on him and you know I'm not saying that he should be exonerated if if he wasn't being a team player and going along in training camp then like that's a ding on him and if he's not in the right spot and they lose to the Lions like but overall he's been a really good player the first couple years so I I am also curious to see his evolution I think he's I I even if you draft someone in the first round, I think he's a starter day one on yes, this team, outside cornerback. I agree you with know, you. If, totally. they, if they wind up, let's say they draft Stingley Jr. or something at 12, it's a good problem to have that they, they have three starting caliber cornerbacks right now. None of them are like pro bowlers right now. But um, I think Cam Dantzler should be given a chance to show that he is a cornerstone cornerback for this team. Yeah, I like so, it. There you go. Breakout candidates for the Vikings in 2000. Look at the positivity. <laughs> Look at the positivity that we just brought. That's speaking of narrative slap down, okay? Like it's we're much, we, much, much more positive on this show than some people give us credit for. Vikings breakout players. In April, we're finding the good. <laughs> and there might be more once they draft a few more players in a little bit. And let's get 16, of, 15. The draft starts on Thursday, April 28th, and we start our live. Hangout session on YouTube with our friends at Surly at six o'clock that night. Judd, tell the audience the details of this once in a lifetime chance 
to drink <laughs> well, I hope the it's not Before I lifetime. Die beer and hang out with us. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, n- night one of the draft, April 28th, which is a week from Thursday. It's almost here. Surly Brewing is where Mackie, Judd, and Declan w- will be doing a live edition of Purple Daily, the draft show. Doors open at 3 at Surly. We start at 6 and go until the first round is done. We'll uh, basically do a live vent line post-draft pick, put you on, give your thoughts. And as Phil mentioned, too, the Before I Die Ale being brewed, especially for this event, one night only on tap. I cannot wait to sample another beer that is going to to be great. And the last thing, too, is this is not a one-off beer that was like something else and they're going to slap a, oh, now it's called Before I I Die. This is a beer being made, being brewed by the fine folks at Surly, especially for this event, especially for you, and more importantly, for me. Most importantly, everything. I'm not going to pull any punches here. You can also win. It's a 65-inch 5 Series TCL Google Smart TV. We're going to be giving that away to someone. And uh, bring canned food items to help support the food group, which helps support giving quality food items to those that need it most across Minnesota, plus giveaways. It's going to be a blast. We want to meet as many of you guys as possible. So don't be bashful. Come on up. We'll have a microphone ready to rock and roll. We're going to be like live on YouTube pretty much the whole night, but you can come up. And, uh, and jump on the microphone and interact with us and cheers a couple. Also, a shout-out to our friends at Chill Boys. I am rocking the Chill Boys long underwear right now. Declan got some Chill Boys in his, I was going to say stocking. Like, there's no stockings for Easter, right? No. They just, just, like, showed up. The basket. The basket. Yeah. Easter yeah. presents are nice. Yeah. Yeah, You're very nice. fortunate, very Declan. Nice. Very nice. Especially when those Easter presents have bamboo fabric that will change oh. your life. Chill Boys is a Minnesota-based company. You can find them online at chillboys.com. And when you do order these life-changing undergarments, tell them that Purple Daily and or Score North gave you the recommendation so that we can uh, we can show them that we we support and we can uh, we can all be wearing our Chill Boys together. Very excited. So comfortable. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get this here. Mock a day. Mock. So every day on the show leading up to the actual draft we are going through a mock a day and we're keeping track of all the players that are mocked to the vikings now in the mocks that we have done since we started doing this a few weeks ago Derek stingley jr has gone six times to the vikings trent mcduffie has gone four times so it's 10 cornerbacks in total there and then jermaine johnson twice jordan davis once a couple of trades in the mix too before we get to this mock a day here from the athletic which is very interesting Our friend Tyler Fornis from NBC Sports Edge, he tweeted this nugget out over the weekend. For the the last 10 weeks, I have been tracking who has been mocked to the Vikings for the Vikings wire. I've compiled 104 unique mock drafts, and I found this particular stat interesting. Of the 104 mock drafts, 101 times a defensive player has been mocked to the Vikings. Only three times has an offensive player been mocked to the Vikings. What do you think of that? I think, again, it is it is the mockers. God bless them, too, by the way. I love you because it's fun. But I think the mockers are essentially going by what the Vikings have done, which, by the way, the GM and coach are gone. And second of all, they're going by need because they're assuming because the Vikings didn't blow up their roster, that they are all in and that that means that they are going to try to fill immediate defensive needs. I think it's missing the point. I think the point is, and I will continue to say this, the point is that the that the Vikings are now coached by an offensive first guy. And that does not mean he's going to ignore defense, but defense was addressed in free agency. And so there's like this massive assumption, well, they're going to go defense, defense. I think if they have, I think if the right guy is available offensively, receiver being the key thing, I think we're not looking at what the Vikings are really probably at least giving serious thought to. And they're looking at, so Thielen did a little bit of a restructure extension where they kick some money down the road, but he's getting no younger. I think his, it's going to be hard to move him next off season too, but like his expiration date is coming up quick. So you're going to have to find a, and if you think KJ Osborne's a number two, that's cool. I think KJ Osborne's probably as a number three, probably where he belongs. So, 
Yes. Putting some more talent there. I think my question would be what other positions besides why I think I could absolutely see a wide receiver at 12. Are there any other offensive positions you could see them taking? Like what if, is it Charles Cross, the tackle from Mississippi State? Like, what if he falls to 12? I mean, you got two tackles under the age of 26 right now. I think they trade back. Yeah. Like, if, if a team wants him, yeah. they trade back. I just think that this assumption that they're going to take a corner is is predicated largely on who ran them as opposed to who runs them now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting. But they, yeah, but for for the mock universe to have 101 out of 104 defensive players mocked to the Vikings is just feels nice like work, a, a market Boy. correction is is on the horizon. I yeah. want to right. mock. mock. So let's see if the latest iteration here from the Athletic also has the Vikings drafting a defensive player. I have I'm I'm going through this with you guys for the first time here. This is from Deontay Lee at the Athletic this morning. Smokescreen season at number one is the title of this mock draft. <laughs> but not really, because he's got Aiden Hutchinson going to the Jaguars at <laughs> number one. Smoke screens. It is smokescreen season, baby. I love it. Yeah, it is. It's good. I liked it. Kayvon Thibodeau going to the Detroit Lions at number two. Charles Cross going to the Texans at three. I feel like the Texans are like the the first two picks aren't ironclad, but like the Texans are this wild card team, right? Yeah. How much do they really believe in that Davis Mills kid at quarterback? Like, I wouldn't rule out a quarterback. But they need offensive help, defensive help. Yeah. Yeah. The Jets taking Sauce Gardner at four. The Giants taking Evan Neal at offensive tackle at five. The Panthers taking Iki Aquanu. He's the tackle from uh, North Carolina State. Then the Giants taking Trayvon Walker, the athletic edge rusher from Georgia. Falcons taking Malik Willis at eight. That makes sense. Yes. On that replacement. Mm-hmm. And then the Texans trading with the Seahawks here into the nine spot to take Ooh. Kyle Hamilton from Notre Dame. Okay. Eagles, is this a trade too? Yeah, Eagles trading into the 10 to take Derek Stingley Jr. Oh. Cornerback. Interesting. Interesting. I like it. And then the Commanders take Drake London first receiver off the board here from USC. So if the draft plays out this way, there's two cornerbacks off the board, one receiver off the board. Jermaine Johnson's still in the mix. He's an edge rusher that's been mocked to the Vikings a couple times. Yep. Would you lean toward receiver? One of the would you lean toward mm-hmm. the there's two wide receivers from Ohio State that are going to be first round picks here. McDuffie's still there, the corner McDuffie who's been McDuffie mocked to them a there. lot. And that oh. is who the Vikings take, according to the, uh, the Athletic at number 12, is Trent McDuffie, <laughs> quarterback Ooh, from boring. Washington. Stop it. Stop the predictability. <laughs> so uh, the write-up says, with Patrick Peterson and Cam Dantzler leading the position group in Minnesota, Trent McDuffie can step in an ideal situation as the starting slot corner for the Minnesota Vikings, with the potential to move outside once Peterson's tenure is finished. McDuffie may not have the same size as the two starting cornerbacks in Minnesota, but each of those players is comfortable with playing in press coverage. McDuffie's technical prowess allows defensive coordinator Ed Donatell to be flexible in his matchups and personnel groupings. I wonder if they might trade back if if the first eleven picks there come to fruition. And and who is who's right after them? Who's like the first three after them? Players, uh, uh, um, teams behind the Vikings at pick twelve. So New Orleans and I'm. Struggling here. It says New Orleans in a trade with... So, okay. So here's what happened. The Texans traded up from 13 in this mock Mm -hmm. with the Seahawks. And now the Seahawks are trading back again in this mock. And Desmond Ritter goes to the Saints at 13. And then the Ravens take the edge rusher from Purdue, George... uh, Is it George Karloftis? Yeah, he's good. Really like him. And then Chris Olave, Ohio State receiver to the Eagles at 15. Jermaine Johnson to the Seahawks at 16. Mm. Yeah. And Garrett Wilson, the receiver from the other receiver from Ohio State to the Jets at 18. Right. Alabama so feel, receiver to the Saints at 19. So wow. interesting. Because I feel like Pittsburgh's obviously the one we keep hearing the trade up with and the Vikings could move back. But then, you know, the actual picks at 13, 14, 15 are Houston, Baltimore, Philly. And Houston, 
that would be their second of their first round picks. Philly has a couple first round picks. Like, I wonder if they'd be also willing to just slide back a couple picks and still accumulate something. I wouldn't be mm-hmm. surprised by that either. Yeah, so interesting. Oh, so interesting. So wait. many different things. Ten days that away? Could, that could happen. Ooh, I, I think want the- a mock! <sighs> McDuffie might disappoint me. Okay. Like I feel if it's not Stingley, I feel like if it's not Stingley, it might. I I just don't. I don't know that I would take a corner. Stingley intrigues me. McDuffie, I think, would be like, uh, well, we got to fill a need. Like I, I understand they think that they can win now. I also want to see at some point, and we have not seen any indication of this yet. A nod to the future, and these guys. I cannot believe that these guys are not going to start to at least address the future. The, the receiver intrigues me, Phil, because of what, what you said about the- Thielen being gone. Uh, it also intrigues me because if you look at the depth chart for what these guys want, they're really not that deep there. Yeah. Like, the position's not that deep. I know we go, well, but they got three. Think about this. Last year, it was deep in how they did things. But in how they're going to now navigate their offense, they could use – another receiver, and the thing that the problem that they've got is Thielen now consistently gets hurt. So, like, if he goes out, well, now what? Osborne bumps up to your two. Who's your three? So, like, the whole thing depth chart-wise makes a lot of sense that that you would, for both the now and the future, address the receiver. Yeah. We have uh, have some breaking quarterback news here in a second. Phenomenal. But first, let's talk about how Judd has lost all kinds of weight over the past few months. And you can, too. That is exactly right. And that's thanks to my friends at Livia Weight Control Centers. And have I got a new offer for you for the month of April. It's the new Simple Start Plan. $59. That's exactly right. 59 bucks. You will get one-on-one personalized and guided support online or in person from the Livia team of experts. So if you don't live in state, don't sweat it online. Uh, Go to Livia.com, L-I-V-E-A.com, 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A. The simple start plan, $59 to lose weight. And then the best part is they will help you keep it off. Livia, L-I-V-E-A.com. Now back to the breaking news. Uh, actually, to Federated first, and then to the breaking oh, news. Oh, you're making here. us wait even longer. Yeah, because Federated is all about preaching safe driving this month and every month, but specifically uh, the month of April, which is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. So there's all kinds of things we can't control in life. Focusing on the road is one of the things we can control. So this is to uh, be hands free. Make sure we're looking ahead and just getting home safely to friends and family today. Your friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company have all sorts of tips on their website, federatedinsurance.com, where it's our business to protect yours. All right, this is going to get Declan and I more excited than Judd. Oh. Sorry, that's the wrong button. Uh, Kyle breaking Slaughter news. signed with the Vikings? Almost. What would you say? You said Kyle Slaughter. Kyle Slaughter signed Vikings. with the Vikings? No. <laughs> no, no, not quite. We should do a full USFL recap at some point. Um, Tom Brady has announced that the match is back June 1st, and it's going to be Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers versus Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes on the golf course. Inject it. Four of the great quarterbacks of our generation. Where's Kirk? All with golf clubs in their hands. I don't know. Why, why is Kirk being left out? Why did those Brady and Rodgers versus I, I, Allen are. and Mahomes. Let's get it. <laughs> what? Can Kirk, do we know, is Kirk a good golfer? You like that? He golfed with Trump. Did he? No, that's not my question, though. Is he a good golfer? (laughs) I just figured I'd throw it out there. He golfed with Donald Trump. He did. 45. That that goofy picture of those guys, their little thumbs up. That's right. So I'm going to be glued to that. Clear your calendar for June 1st, baby. Five hours of trash talking. Josh Allen just sends absolute missiles with his driver. And gets really drunk. Yeah. I just feeling he just, just pounds he tall is boys all just drive for show, no yes. putt for dough for Josh Allen. Total guess. <laughs> I have that is that is completely reckless golf speculation. Apparently, Mahomes is a, is a really good golf. He's really good. Like He's golfer. really good. Yeah. What sport would would he not be successful at? Hockey, maybe because he Hockey, yeah. can't skate. But you could. I you bet could, you that, well. But if you learned how to skate early, that's like, what I was gonna say. I bet within a week, yeah, Minnesota, that nice. guy could skate. Yeah. 
Dad played here. Sure. There's no sport that that guy, my guess, is bad at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and I hate him for that because I'm for not good at sports. I just talk. I just critique him. Some people would say you're not even good at talking about sports. No. That's no, probably true. Some people don't like me. No, some they, people don't. Some people don't like Judd Zolgad. God no. But it was Easter yesterday, and so I'm in a great mood. All right. So don't try and don't try and spoil Judd's mood on this week here. Ten days until the NFL draft. We got oh, you covered certainly. every single day on Purple Daily. Daily Vikings Entertainment. See you guys.